So tonight, um, I want to speak to us on a theme, Know Before Whom You Stand. That's my, the title of my trash tonight, Know Before Whom You Stand. Just to hear it again, but these are words that I, I want us to know and I want us to begin to see. So know before whom you stand. All right. Now, in many synagogues, I've been told that these words adorn the ark, right? Right over the ark, these words are written. Da lefane me ata omed, know before whom you stand. And immediately I'm thinking that we need to put that uh, right in there in Hebrew and in English so that you will be seeing that as you sit in the sanctuary. You'll be able to look above the ark and you'll see those words. Da lefane me ata omed, know before whom you stand. Because we want to have that awareness that we are uh, congregants, we are worshippers, and we are mindful. We have a pure mindfulness of the presence of Elohim. And those words help us to see that we are in the presence of our King and we need to conduct ourselves with reverence in our hearts towards Him. Every worship service is about instilling awe in the worshippers. That's why we try to do everything that we can to facilitate, to ensure everything goes smoothly so that you will hear, so that you will see, and that more so that you will connect with your Father, connect with our, with our God by the power of the Spirit. So that's the purpose of worship, all right? So that you and I could be elevated, we could be connected so that we could instill awe and draw us nearer to the presence of Elohim. So that phrase, know before whom you stand, is meant to, to zero our minds in before whom we stand. But this doesn't just apply to the shul, synagogue. We want to have it there because the synagogue is a set apart place. And we want to know when we come to that place in whose presence we are in. But we also want to be mindful that that's a statement that we need to have in front of us. So wherever we go, no matter where we go, right, those words should be before us. Know before whom we stand. We should see it with like, like black fire and white fire and red fire. We should see those words wherever you will go, right? Whether we are home in the car, on the street, whether we, we rise up or we lie down. Wherever we are, we are, we are mindful that heaven is witnessing everything about our what we say, do, and think, right? What, uh, uh, what we think, what we speak, and what we do, because we know before whom we stand. This is the essential beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as I spoke last week, so I'm speaking this week again, because Abbot was bringing us into that, that, that trembling reality, that trembling awareness. Know before whom you stand. All right. Now, this is easier said than done, but still, by God's grace, we want to launch into it and begin to do it. It is easier to study this and to read the scriptures, but we want to begin to bring it home. We want to begin to do this because you and I realize that when we check our thoughts, our words and our deeds during the day, not many of them are as noble. Paul says, think on these things, speak of, of, about these things. But many times our, our minds are filled with selfish ideas, are filled with unkind sentiments, vain amusements, right? Uh, entertainment. So we're not focused on the presence of, of, of God. We don't know before whom we stand. And the exception is when we pause and we are mindful that we are in the presence of God. We are in the ever-abiding presence of God. So this this is not to, to make us feel too badly, as it were, but to help us to realize that we need help from God. So there, there, there's a prayer that I want to give us to pray to help us because we are prone to wonder from the awareness of God's presence. And the prayer is this, Father, forgive me for neglecting you. Help me to keep a clear vision of you before my eyes. Without your help, I will never do better on my own. My mind always wanders, uh, wanders after this world's distractions. So we are not just uh, 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 wondering about the marvels of God. Our mind wander. We are distracted, and God is trying to bring us back to that awareness. So go with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy 29. All right? We're going to know before whom we stand. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And I wonder, I, I, I'm praying, God, that we'll get that sign up. So that we, we, are, we are aware of this, right? So in Deuteronomy 29, verse 4, we have a text that is given here. Yet to this day, Adonai has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. That's in last week's Torah portion, right? Adonai has not given you a heart to know. Adonai has not given you eyes to see. Adonai has not given you ears to know. So the question is asked, so why? 
And I want you to see he's not putting blame on Israel because he has sovereignly not given them eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to know, which tells us that there's something that is coming. It tells us that there, there is a longing that God wants us to have because he wants us to have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to know. But even though Israel would have seen all these miracles, the plagues in Egypt, he saw those miracles that would have been wrought. He saw the, 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 the sea opening, saw the, the, the manna and water from the rock, all those things. Yet God says they didn't have eyes to see. They didn't have ears to hear. They didn't have a heart to know. Because that comes from Elohim. It's come by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So he's wanting us to begin to see this. Now, now I want you to look with me now to verse 10. And this is where this week's to our portion begins. It says, verse 10, you stand today, all of you, before Adonai your Elohim. You are standing today before Adonai your Elohim. And it's from there that I want to use that text to, to, to bring us into that abiding awareness. Know before whom you stand. You are standing today, all of you. And I want you to see, he said, your chiefs, your, your, your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the alien who's within you, your camps, and the one who chops your wood and the one who draws your wood. In other words, Israel and the nations are standing before God. And God is saying to Israel and the nations, be aware, have a pure intention, have a pure mindfulness before whom you stand. Live your life in the face of God. Know before whom you stand. Because if we don't know before whom we stand, we will not think, speak, and act a certain way. And God is wanting us to get that. Each of us must, must know this and see it. You must see it above the ark. You must see it wherever you go. You must see it before you. Know before whom you stand. And this is what Abba is given to us. See, life is, it, it has a destination. Life it is about pursuing knowing God. All right, and that's what we do. It. This is about pursuing the kingdom. This is about, about pursuing Olam Haba, the world to come. So God wants us to, to understand he wants us to know. He wants us to know before we stand. And we are trying to increase in the knowledge of God. We're trying to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. If you go with me to uh, um, Second Peter, you would see something. Go with me to, to Second Peter in the Apostolic Scriptures. Second Peter, and I want you to see something. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5. It says, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supplying moral excellence and to moral excellence, knowledge, that's knowing God, self-control and to your self-control, perseverance and to your perseverance, godliness and to godliness, brotherly kindness and your brotherly kindness, love. I want you to see there is a progression. I want you to see these steps, these ladder, right? And, and, and we begin with faith, then we press on to knowing God. And we press on to have the love of God. And so God is telling us, listen, knowing God is not the same about knowing things about him. It is having that relationship. It's not just a memorization of facts. It is coming to know God. The, the better we know our spouses or know our children, the happier we would be because we begin to dwell with them according to knowledge, according to understanding. We begin to know what they like, what they don't like. And this is what God is saying. You, you need to know me. They that know their God will be strong and do exploit. So God wants us to know him. But how do we know this God that, that is that is un, unknowable? Yet he says, I condescend. I sit high, but I look low. I want you to know me. So we worship this God the unknown God, because he wants us to begin to know him. And he does make it possible for us to begin to know him. And so one of the ways of knowing him is to begin to acknowledge him. So in this text in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, in Proverbs chapter 3, it's a text that, that I know that we know, but this is one simple aspect of knowing God. And this is one Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 6, right? Trust in Adonai with all your heart. Remember, in Hebrew, the word heart there is mind, right? So trust in Lord with all your mind and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So it's important to see that the word translated acknowledge here has knowledge in it, right? In all your ways, God wants us to know him. He wants us to begin to acknowledge that he is involved in every aspect of our life. He wants us to notice him. He wants us to be aware of his presence. Know before who will acknowledge me in all your ways. In other words, all your ways, everything that you're thinking and doing, know before whom you stand. And I want you to see 
That's how we, how do we acknowledge God? When we begin to say a blessing. So you wake up in the morning, you acknowledge God. You use the bathroom, you acknowledge God. You see a beautiful sunset, you acknowledge, whatever, whatever. Know before whom you stand. And we say this blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. Baruch Atah. Focus on that you. I want you to see that you. Who is that you? This is the all-powerful master of the universe universe not just blessed be god but blessed are you and pause at that word you because you want to understand who you're addressing you're addressing god you're addressing the most high god and he wants you begin to know him all right so again know before whom you stand not just um, uh, uh, memorizing it starts with that but god wants you to to, to 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 have an intimate awareness of his presence that he's ever before you just add you, when you stand in front of the ark as a worshiper, know before whom you stand. That's why you have to be focused when you come in the synagogue. That's why you can't turn to the left or the right and be distracted by chat, by, 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 by small chat. You have to be focused on God. You, you know before whom you stand. That's the awareness that God is bringing to us, right? Now, I want you to go with me to another text that I will have shared. But again, I'm bringing it back to us by God's grace. Go with me to the book of Psalms in Psalm 16. Psalm 16. 8 to 11. Again, we want to know before whom we stand, right? So Psalm 16, look at this. Psalm 16, 8 to 11. Hear the word. I have said Adonai continually before me. Remember, we have been intentional. I have said Adonai continually before me. I'm making an intentional decision to know before whom I stand. Because he's at my right hand, I'm so aware that he's at my right hand. And that's, that's not literal. That, that's just an expression that you're aware that God is there at your right hand. He, he, he's the one who's supplying your strength. You're aware of his presence. All right? He's at your right hand. I will not be shaken. Why? Because I know who's with me. I know who's my invisible partner. And I'm going through life. Therefore, having that awareness, verse 9, therefore, my mind is glad and my glory rejoices. Because I know in whose presence I'm in, my flesh also will dwell securely. Oh, my God, because you're aware of God. And then look at verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Even in Sheol, I am standing before you. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So I want you to see, knowing before whom you stand, and then it moves on to talk about, uh, about death, no decay, and it talks about resurrection. Did you see it? If you would know before whom you stand, you will be able to pick that up because of powerful things that happen. See, because when you're in the presence of God and you know before whom you stand, you begin to see the diamond turning. You begin to get revelation of who he is. You begin to have doors open. You begin to have a business of knowledge open because God is, is, is ever revealing himself. He, he's like a, a, a fountain that is ever bubbling up and it's not static, it's dynamic. So go with me now to, to the book of Acts. Go with me to the book of Acts. Acts, and we want to see the apostle Peter, the chief, the chief disciple of Rabbi Yeshua. He's given us something. This is the day of, of, of Shabbat, and he's proclaiming this message to, to the people of Judea. All right, He's proclaiming this message to all those who would have come up to keep the festival of Shabbat. So we just break it into the thought, right? Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Yeshua the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. He's telling them about Yeshua of Nazareth. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Notice this. You nailed to a cross by hands of godless men and put him to death. But Elohim raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. Why? Because he did not commit any sin. So, sin, so death has no claim on him. So, so, so Yeshua was about to break forth out of that because they tried to, to, to keep him down, but he was sinless. But I want you to see now as you go on, verse 25. For David says of him, now watch this, beloved. Know before whom you stand. I saw Adonai always in my presence. He's quoting from the Septuagint. He's quoting Psalm 16. And look what he says. For he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. This is Peter speaking. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. 
because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your holy one to undergo decay. You have made known to me the parts of life. You will make me full of, of, of your gladness uh, of, with your presence. So he's quoting Psalm 16. And look what is happening. If you know before you stand, the Spirit of God is about to give you a revelation that to transform who you see and understand before who we stand. Because you see, you got to know this by God's grace. Know it by, by the Spirit of the living God. Look what he says. Brethren, verse 29, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. He's saying what David wrote in six, Psalm 16 doesn't just apply to David, the physical person. It applies to someone else. Know before whom you stand. And so because he was a prophet, that's David, and knew that God had sworn to him and ought Sit one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead. Psalm 16, he was looking ahead. That's prophetic. And spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That he neither, he, he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Oh my God. David suffered decay. But the greater son of David did not suffer decay. Peter is applying the text that applied to to, 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 to David, and he's saying that text is not just applied to David, he's looking ahead and it applies to someone else. Well, who is this holy one that did not suffer decay? Who is it? Know before whom you stand, because you've got to know Yeshua of Nazareth. Look what he said, verse 32. This Yeshua, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses, therefore having been exalted to what? The right hand of God. No, I have said the Lord before me. He's at my right hand. This is not just about us now. This is about the Messiah. Oh, my God. Can we get this, beloved? All right. The right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth which we both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, hmm. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Again, know before whom you stand. Watch verse 36 carefully. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know. You've got to know this. For certain, no doubt, no ambiguity. You've got to know in your know that you know this for certainty. That God has made him, who him? Yeshua of Nazareth. Both Lord and Messiah, whom you crucified. Are you getting this? You gotta know before whom you stand. And Psalm 16, though it applies to us to be intentional about God's awareness, he said it applies also to him about the Messiah. The Messiah did not suffer decay. He was buried, but he didn't suffer decay. God raised him up and put him in his presence. And in the presence of the Father is the Messiah. And this Messiah is both Lord and Messiah. Look at verse 36. He has made him both Lord and Messiah. Peter is applying this to Yeshua, the Messiah. But what is mind-boggling is this. The word Lord there in verse 36 is kurios, which is the Greek for Lord. But the Hebrew equivalent is Adonai. If you can get this, if you can know before me, son, Peter is saying Yeshua is Adonai and Messiah. And you've got to know this for certain. Know before whom you stand. Because you see, if you don't know this, you're worshiping whom you do not know. But you've got to know that this one who lived in the awareness of God, Yeshua the Messiah, who died, didn't suffer the case, resurrected, and is in the presence of God, God has made him both Adonai and Messiah. And you're going to know this for certain. Know before whom you stand. That's why he's trying to get us to understand this. He, God has made him Adonai. Kurios. Not just master. Kurios. The Greek Kurios is the equivalent for Hebrew Adonai. God has made him Adonai. When I was in the church, there was a song that I loved to sing. Jesus name above all names and i used to sing that song thinking that the word jesus is the name above all names but go with me to philippians chapter 2 if you will and i came to uh, uh, understand that the name jesus as wonderful as it is that's not the name that is above all names no look with me to, to philippians chapter 2 verse 9 for this reason also god highly exalted him that's yeshua the messiah 
and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. He bestowed on Yeshua the name which is above every name. What is the name above every name? yod heh vav what we call Adonai or Hashem. So that at the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on the earth and on the heaven, and every tongue will confess that Yeshua the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because the Father has made him both Adonai and Messiah. But what you may not know is this, this um, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Paul is quoting from Isaiah 45. Go back with me to Isaiah 45. You see, because you got to know before whom you stand. Isaiah 45, we have this text. Isaiah 45, picking it up from verse 21. There is no other God beside me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of you, for I am God and there is no other. This is Adonai speaking. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me, that is Adonai, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance, confess. That is what Paul is quoting. And he's applying that text that applied to Adonai. He's applying it also to Yeshua of Nazareth, who was given the name, what is above every name. What is the name above every name? Not Yeshua. The name above every name is yod heh vav -Hey. How that is pronounced, we don't know for sure, but we say Adonai Hashem. That is the name that is above every name. And he said that that name has been bestowed upon Yeshua. He has been made Adonai and Messiah. And look what he said. They said to me, only in Adonai are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him and all who are angry at him will be put to shame. In Adonai, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and they will, they will experience glory. Who is doing that? Yeshua HaMashiach. So if you begin to see this, you begin to say, oh my God, if I know before whom I stand, I know the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and I know that Yeshua of Nazareth is more than just a rabbi. He is the Son of the living God. He is Adonai in the flesh. He is Adonai. He has been made Adonai. Know before whom you stand. I know this for certain. Let the house of Israel know this. And after, or after 1800 years, the house of Israel and many nations are still stumbling over this. But it has to come by revelation of God. God, go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, because I believe what's happening there is happening again among the nations today. In John chapter 4, in verse 20, 22, Yeshua speaking to the uh, uh, Samaritan woman said, You worship what you do not know. Is it possible that many of his believers today are worshiping who they do not know? He told the woman back then, you're worshiping what you do not know. Is it possible today that people could be worshiping who they do not know? Because they don't know the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They don't know that God has bestowed his name upon his Son and has made him both Adonai and Messiah. And you're supposed to know this for certain, but you're worshiping him. Here is this woman worshiping him. And she didn't get the revelation. She said, when Messiah come, he would tell him. He said, I am the Messiah. And then when she got that revelation, that aha moment, she left her container and go. When you get that revelation, all your arguments are left behind because you get a revelation before whom you're standing. She did not know whom she was. She thought she was just standing before a normal, ordinary Jew until she found out that this Jew is Rabbi Yeshua of Nazareth. This Jew is the Messiah. And not just the Messiah. Look further. Verse 42, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. You see, not no ordinary man now. He started, like, started off as rabbi, but now he is Adonai, he's curious, he's Lord. And you're going to get a revelation of that. Just like Peter had to say, you are he, the Messiah, the son of the living God. He got that revelation. He began to know before whom he stands. Just as Thomas had to get that revelation. Aha moment. My Lord and my God. I can preach to you until I'm blue in the face. You will not get that revelation until the Spirit of God open your eyes and you begin to know who Yeshua is. The son of the living God. Know before whom you stand. Be certain about who your master and savior is. You got to see him as Adonai and Messiah, as Messiah and Adonai, because he is both. Blessed is he, and he is blessed. So as we go through it, I want us to see what Abba is saying to us. See, there's a difference here between um, Judaism and Messianic Judaism. Faith 
on God through Yeshua of Nazareth is only substantial difference between traditional Judaism and Messianic Judaism. What distinguishes us? Can I tell us? It, what distinguishes us from traditional Judaism is this. The difference is not in what we believe about God, but in how we believe about God. You see, the Jewish people believe Hashem. They believe God. But we believe on Hashem through Yeshua. That's the difference. Because we begin to know that he's the Messiah, but not just the Messiah. He has been made both Adonai and Messiah. That's what you begin to understand. So before people uh, uh, you're calling on God, but God has said, I want you to know before whom you stand. I want to give you this parable of these two daughters. Once a man had two daughters uh, 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 and he went off to war. Before he left, he promised to return. And he promised them, when I return, I will bring you each a fine string of pearls and a summer dress. No one except the girls knew about the promise. So after many years, the man had not returned. Everybody presumed that he was dead. But the daughters, however, continued to hope and they believed and they wait. A decade passed and they grew to become adults, but neither of them forgot their father or his promises. Deep in their hearts, they knew that they would hope and believe. One day, a messenger came seeking the girls. Finding only one daughter, he told her, I have news of your father. He is returning and he sends you this gift. The messenger presented her with a fine string of pearls. Now, both girls still believe in the promise of the father, but only one received a token of the promise and the other had not. One had faith in the father's promise on the basis of a hope and confidence, but the other had faith in the father's promise on the basis of the good news that she had already received on the basis of partial fulfillment of her father's promise. She already held the pearl. She had no question in her mind that she would soon see her father face to face. Think of that girl's confidence. Think about her certainty and joy. She no longer had any doubt that her father was coming. She knew that he would bring that summer dress because he, she had already received the pearls. The faith on God is just like that. We are believing, we have confidence in God because we have already received the token. Remember I said to us, the difference between traditional Judaism and Messianic Judaism, the difference is not in what we believe because we believe the same thing. The difference is how we believe in God. You believe in God, believe also. So in me, we believe in God through Yeshua the Messiah. That's why when you read the apostolic scriptures, you always see the apostles can't write God without bringing Yeshua into play. If you look at, at, at Romans chapter one, he would say this grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua. I thank God through Yeshua. Is that if they can't speak about God without bringing in Yeshua because that's how they believe they've received the token. And you and I are coming to understand this. We're growing in the grace and knowledge. And I want you to see what Paul says, and not Paul, uh, Peter, in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter, I want you to see this text. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. He says, grow in the grace and in the knowledge. Know who Yeshua is. Know that he is Messiah and Adonai, Adonai and Messiah. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, to him. Be glory. To him be glory. I thought only to God. To him be glory. Both now, right now, and to the day of eternity. So there are those who are waiting in eternity to declare that Yeshua is Lord of all. But God says, now. <laughs> now. You have received the tokens now. When you know before whom you stand, you will have an aha moment. My Lord and my God. And he gives you that revelation. I will talk, I will speak, I will give the example, I will model it, but then comes the aha moment. You know before whom you stand. And I want you to see this, right? I zeroed in on know, but I want you to look at the word before. Know before. It is knowing that you are in front of God. Knowing that God is before you. Set God before you. In the tabernacle, it says that you would light the menorah and it would give its light in front of you. That's in Exodus chapter 25 verse 37, shed light in front. In other words, keep God in front. Who is in front of us? The presence of God, the Shekinah. Know before whom is that? I am no before who I am. Oh my God. And then what's the other one? Whom? Know before whom? Oh my God. I want you to think about the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Ekad. You know that Shema, right? But go with me as the apostle the Gentile expands on the Shema. Go with me the first uh, Corinthians chapter 8. 
This is the Rav Shul. This is Rabbi who studied under Gamaliel, who understood these things. He understood traditional Judaism, but he got a revelation. Why are you persecuting me, Shaul? I am Yeshua. And notice, I am in glory. I am Yeshua in glory. Mm -hmm. I am a man in a new physicality. I am, I, I am the embodiment of God the Father. I am, I am in glory. I am calling this life is from me. <laughs> you get this. Know before whom you stand. Listen to what he said. In, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. He's expounding on the Shema. Watch this. Yet for us, there is but one God. Where did we read that? In the Shema. The Father. So Paul is saying, when you read the Shema, the word God refers to the Father. From whom are all things. Notice, whom, whom before whom he stands. And we exist for him. And one Adonai. Who is the Adonai in the Shema? Yeshua, the Messiah. By whom are all things. And we exist through him. Oh my God, are we seeing it? God is trying to get us to understand these things. He is bringing us into the dance. He said, listen, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and you are in me. That's why we make this prayer. Like a branch that remains in the vine, so may I remain in him. Just that he also remains in the Father, and the Father in him, in order that they may remain in us. Are you beginning to see the Shema? Know before whom you stand. And he said, you. Know before whom you stand. You've got to see that you know who you are and who you are. You are in him. You and I have derivative existence because he created us. You and I have to know who we are and who we are and before whom we are standing. You know before whom you. You've got to have an awareness of who you are because you have an awareness of who God is. The only way you can begin to know yourself is when you begin to know God. Because you and I don't even know ourselves. We have all these challenges to even know about ourselves. But God knows the deep mysteries of our heart. He knows the secret. He knows why we do what we're doing. We don't even know that. But he's saying to us, no. And then he comes with, 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 with the word stand. You are standing. Oh my God. Know before whom you stand. You have a privilege to stand in the presence of the king. All right? Know before whom you stand. Notice that he gave you feet so that you could stand. Notice that he said in Ephesians chapter 6 that you stand against the wilds of the devil and withstand and having all, all remain stand. You've got to understand standing. It is a powerful concept to know because you are more than the angels standing before God. But I want you to go even further. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. Oh my God. God, open our eyes so that we can know before whom we stand. In Daniel chapter 7, we have this text given to us. Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. I want you to read it from verse 9, right? About the ancient of days. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, Daniel has been given a vision. Daniel is taken out of space and time. And he's looking into eternity. And he's seeing something beyond space and time. He's seeing something that, that has already happened. Because in that time, this room, there's no past, present, or future. So Daniel is all, already seeing in the past, what is yet to happen in the future? It is already happening. You've got to get that rare when you, when you come to God, right? So look what it is. Verse 10. A river of fire was flowing before the ancient of days. That's God the Father. And coming out from before him, thousands upon thousands were attending him. That's the angels. They were attending to him. They were serving him. And watch this other part. And myriads upon myriads were what? Standing before him. They were standing before him. Myriads upon myriads. Who is that? That is speaking about the, what the holy days is coming about. Standing in the court of heaven. Awaiting judgment. You are standing. Myriads upon myriads. You got to see your name in there. In those myriads. Because all humanity will stand before God. Now you will have awareness before whom you stand. You didn't get it now? Now you will get it. Know before who we are standing, because we are standing for judgment. And then he says, the books were open. That's Rosh Hashanah. That's what this, this whole thing is about. The book of the wicked, the book of the righteous, and the book of the intermediate. God is judging us based on our thoughts, words, and deeds. We are standing before God. That's why we have to have awareness before we stand. And then he said, I kept looking. And while I kept looking, there was a horn speaking all sorts of nonsense, and I can't hear. That's what's happening, because we don't have an awareness of who God is, who Yeshua is, who the Spirit is, because a little horn is speaking, blowing in our minds. So we, we distort it. We distort in Scripture. We don't understand. We don't believe. We all call, oh, 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 the little horn in your head. You've got to remove that. But keep on looking. Look at verse 13. I kept on looking in the night season. Yes, 
I'm seeing through a glass darkly, but in the night season, I keep on looking, I'm getting penetrated inside. And while I look, I behold with the clouds of heaven. Oh my God, I'm seeing something now. It's not just pitch dark. One like the son of man was coming. Oh my God, what is this scene before whom I'm standing? He came up to who? The ancient of days. That is no created being. This is the son of man. You've got to understand this. The son of man is the supreme messianic title for the Messiah. That's why Yeshua came before himself as son of man, not as a human being. He's saying, I am the son of man. The son of man is Lord of the Shabbat. I am the one of Daniel 7. You've got to understand that. But watch this. He came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. When did he come up to the ancient of days? Well, when he resurrected and he ascended into heaven, he's coming up to the ancient. Are you beginning to see that? Because for time, past, present, and future becomes insig insignificant, right? And to him, Yeshua, was given dominion. This is already past tense, but it's looking in the future. Glory and a kingdom and all peoples and nations, all men and language might serve him. But what's that word serve? It is a Hebrew word for worship. All mankind will worship him. His dominion is an everlasting domain which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. When you stand before the ancient of days, you will see the connection between the Father and the Son. You will see the connection between Elohim and Adonai. You will see that Adonai, who says, I don't, I don't share my glory with another, but here is Yeshua being ushered into glory. The only reason, the only conclusion we could come to is that Yeshua is not created. Yeshua is Elohim, Emmanuel with us. If he doesn't share his glory and Yeshua is coming up with his right hand, he's coming up with it, then it must be that Yeshua is more than a rabbi. You've got to remember when the disciples went out on that boat and they had that storm and they saw the master walking on water. They couldn't deal with him. He said, it's a ghost. It is a ghost. He said, no, it is I. You've got to know the it is an I. Stop thinking Yeshua is some lesser God. It is I. When he rebuked the winds and waves, and, and he came into the boat, it says they worship him. Why would they worship him? They knew him as rabbi, but suddenly they got a glimpse that this is more than a rabbi. This is the one who walks upon the waters. And how did they know? They go back to Job and they saw that God walks upon the water. Job chapter 8 and 9. You'll see it there. So this Messiah is more than my rabbi. He is God in flesh. And they got a glimpse of that. Oh my God. So as you go forward, I want us to see this because you got to know before whom you stand. You see, Jacob fell asleep. He was asleep. And he said, when I got up, I, I, I wasn't aware before whose presence I am. I surely God was in this place, but I don't know it. He didn't recognize before whom he was sleeping, standing as it were, right? But God knew, and God was trying to get his attention. Do you know before whom you stand? Are you aware about whom you stand? Do you know when you stand in front of another human being? Do you know there's a midrash that says when a human being is walking, the angel says, step apart because the image of God is coming? Do you understand how the angels see you because you bear the image of God? Do you understand when you stand in front of another human being, you've got to know before whom you stand? And treat that person, regardless of what they're doing, in dignity and honor, because you are aware of the image of God in them. If you don't, it's because your little horn blowing in your head, and you're just feeling the dust, and you're not seeing. So you treat that person as if they're less than nothing. But if you see God, you will treat them differently, because you know before whom you stand. So as I close, I want to bring this home to us the applications and implications of this portion. If you go in this portion, but with, with, um, um, Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 31, I want to just bring this out to us. Deuteronomy 31 verse 7, then Moses called to Joshua and said to him, be strong and courageous because you will bring the people into the land of Israel. I want to say this to you, brethren. When you know before whom you stand, you will see Joshua as Yehoshua, Yeshua. And it is Yeshua who Joshua brought the children of Israel into the land. It is Yeshua who is bringing us into the kingdom. It is Yeshua who is bringing us into the presence of God. Are you beginning to see this, beloved? You know before whom you, do you understand who Joshua was? Do you understand that Moses was like, the, 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 his face was like the sun. They said that Joshua was like the moon. It seemed a let down, but it is in that moment of time that we elevate the mundane to the holy. In the mundane, we see the miraculous. In Yeshua, we begin to understand that he brings us into the presence of God. He brings us into the holy land. It is Yeshua, know before whom you stand. And then I want you to see also, 
concerning um, Deuteronomy 29. He tells us about the, 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 the secret sins. He said, this, this, this wormwood, this, this fruit of bitterness. And I just always thought that that meant a bitter person. It means that too, all right? It means that to a bitter person, all right? Uh, 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 please, don't remain bitter. You're not a Karaili, right? You're not called to remain bitter. God wants you to change. But what he's saying, the bitter root here is, it's you thinking that you could sin in secret and God doesn't know. But look what he said. You are saying, I have peace so I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. I have peace, though I'm sinning secretly. I want you to remember in Revelation, the eyes of the Lamb of God. He sees everything that's happening in the congregation because he is the Lamb of God and judgment has been given to him. You've got to know that there's nothing secret in the presence of God. Yeshua penetrates. You can't want to come and argue theology with me and you have five husbands. Come on, man. Deal with it. Deal with that foolishness and then let, let's talk. Yes, your theology doesn't save you, but it's important. You want to come and argue theology with me and your life is, is in shambles? Come on. Wake up and understand before whom you stand. This Yeshua is more than a rabbi. This Yeshua is the one who was penetrating inside because he is one with God. I and my father are one. You've got to know of a certainty that God has made him both Adonai and Messiah. And when you know that, you begin to see him differently and yourself differently, right? I want you to see also in Deuteronomy, in Yeshua, there is Teshuvah. In Deuteronomy 30, when you read that text, you see God says, I will return you, I will return you, I will bring you back, I will bring you back. I will. Well, who came preaching the message of Teshuvah? Yeshua. It's in Yeshua that he brings us Teshuvah. Repent the kingdom of heaven. Are you seeing Joshua, are you seeing Yeshua? Are you seeing that he is Emmanuel, God in the flesh? His name is Yeshua. Yah is salvation. He has come to save us from our sins. Who saves us? Not our theology. It is Yeshua who is both Lord and Messiah who saves us. May God help us to have the right Yeshua that can save us because of the diminished understanding of Yeshua. He works beyond that, but you will suddenly begin to realize who he is. When you stand before him, all foolishness will cease. The little horn will cease, and your soul will tremble before whom you stand. I want you to see that Yeshua also takes us beyond repentance. What is beyond repentance? Look at verse 6. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. So beyond repentance, there is an inner transformation that comes. To whom, to God, to, the God to whom we return is the God who transforms us. When we return, uh, Deuteronomy 31 to 3, then he transforms us. What did he say of Yeshua? We were like sheep strained, but we have returned to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Who are we returning to? Yeshua, our savior. The God who saves. You've got to know before whom you stand. All right? So this is what is happening as God is transforming us. He's bringing us into the circumcision of the Messiah. He said, you circumcise your flesh, but then I will circumcise it in the world to come. You apply diligence to understand who I am, but I will give you the aha moment. I will give you glimpses that you could say, oh, my Lord and my God. You are he, the Mashiach El. You are the Messiah God. You're not just Messiah. You're Messiah, Mashiach El. That's the proper Hebrew of, Psalm, of, of, of Matthew 16. You understand in your, for whom you stand, right? So stay focused. You know why we are so distracted? Because we have uncircumcised hearts. That's why we don't have an, a vision of the lamb in the midst of the throne. I try to not let many moments pass down. I have that vision of the lamb in the midst of the throne. I focus on Revelation 4 and 5 because I want to keep the lamb before me. The lamb who was slain, the lamb who the lamb was becoming a lion. I want to keep him in the midst of the throne. I want to keep him there. Because I know that the grace of Messiah that I'm saying, I am mindful before whom I stand. All right? And as I close, I want to bring us to another one. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 11, it says this. When all Israel comes to the, appear before the Lord your God, the place in which he chooses, you shall read this law in front of Israel in their hearing. You shall read it. This is a, 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 a command, as it were, that is given in the singular. The you there is singular. And it's like the king. The king shall read this every seven years. The king is reading. Are you beginning to see this? The king will teach Israel, look what it says, assemble the people, the men and the women and the children, and the alien who is in your, in your tongue, so that they may hear and learn and fear. The king will read the Torah. Who is the king of Israel? Yeshua. And when he reads the Torah, 
When he writes that Torah upon our heart, we begin to learn to hear and fear him. That's the king that we are waiting to come back to, to, to read his Torah so that we will know he is Melech Israel. That he's not just the son of God, he's the son of man. Understanding what son of man means, not just human being. He is, a, he is the supreme messiah. He is the one who comes to the ancient of days. Do you think he's not speaking about angels? He's speaking about the ancient of days and the son of man. That's father and son, if you can get it. And they are one. You've got to see this playing out before God. So as we close, I want you to see it is the messiah who is teaching us to learn, to obey, and to fear him. When you know who Messiah is, you will see how he lived his life, and you and I will live our life in the same way. All right? So we have this disciples' prayer that we pray. And we say, for the sake of the Master Yeshua, in his merit and virtues, may the sayings of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Where did David get that? He got it from this week's to a portion. This thing is not too far from you. It's in your mouth, and it's in your heart. It's in your mouth so that you could speak it. It's in your mind so that you could think it, so that you could observe it. Notice, thought, word, and deed. And he's saying it's not too difficult. You can do this because the Messiah in you will allow you to be able to do. That is the king of glory. When you know who he is, that he is Emmanuel in you, that you are in him, and he is in the Father, and they are in you, that they may remain in us, and we remain in them. You begin to see the dance and say, oh, Lord, my God, thank you. So now, why have you gathered so that you could be instilled with the awe of God, that you could know before whom? I pray, God, that each of us would get a revelation and know before whom. And that's why you've come to worship. You've gathered here not to see a, 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 a rabbi. You, you come here. You come here to, 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 to be elevated, to, to, to have awe of God, to know before whom you stand. To know your God so that you can be strong and do exploits. To know what he has done for you and you will give your life for him. You understand the portion of you know before whom you stand. He is the father. May, 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 may the grace of Yeshua the Messiah, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. May we see that, that unity, that echadness, that oneness, and know before whom we stand. This God who we cannot explain but who explains us. The uncontainable God that was contained in humanity. This God who is both eminent and transcendent. Know before whom you stand and tremble at the fact that you don't know him. And it had is the audacity to think that you have figured him out. If I could explain the Trinity to you in the best language, I would have been wrong. I cannot explain that. that that's the word that is that even bereft of, it, it, it lacks on the fullness of understanding. We're trying to explain things that are beyond us. We just know he has represented, he's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. Know before whom you stand. Don't try to figure it out. Allow him to live his life in and through you and be transformed. Because you know before whom you stand. And if you don't know, he will tell you. And in that day, there will be silence as he reveals himself to us. And then you and I will bow before him like Thomas and say, my Lord and my God. Shabbat shalom, everyone.